Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, we are happy to welcome uh, Bino Yuseta from York uh, University uh, with a talk on integrable E models uh, for DHN Simons and the film Gaudian models. Uh, please, Bino. Well, thanks very much. Uh, so, let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk at this journal club. So, what I want to tell you about is two recent. Um, unifying frameworks which were proposed for describing integrable field theories. So first one is based on 4D Chan Simons theory and the second one on Alfa and Godin models. So most of the talk will be based on the 4D Chan Simons perspective, but I'll also mention uh, the Alfa and Godin story because it, uh, as I'll try to explain, it's very closely related. So the talk will be based on these two papers. Uh, first one with Marco Benini and Alex Schenko and then the follow up with uh, Sylvain Lacroix. So uh, because most of, or everyone here is actually an expert on integrability, I'll just give a very brief uh, recollection of uh, what an integrable field theory is just so that we're on the same page. So uh, what I mean by two dimensional integrable field theory is a field theory, and I'm talking about classical integrable field theories. It's a field theory in two dimensions, um, which whose equations of motion can be recast in the form of some zero curvature equation for some connection, which depends meromorphically on the spectral parameter. So this is built out of the fields of the theory and it's on shell flat. So uh, an example to bear in mind throughout the talk, which will come back every now and then, is the principal car model. So this is a, a sigma model for a group valued field G on the two dimensional world sheet, which I'll call sigma. And um, you can build the lax matrix uh, by first constructing this, um, the algebra valued one form, current J. And then the lax matrix is this well-known expression in terms of the current. And so what it has, the property it has is that it's on shell flat. So this term is always zero by construction, but this term vanishes on shell by the equations of motion. So given the usefulness of the lax connection, and in, for example, in constructing integrable, uh, in, integrals of motion, uh, you have to wonder what its origin is and why it even exists. So um, there are two proposals for explaining the origins of the lax connections in various integrable field theories. One is more algebraic in nature and one is more um, geometric. So let me first recall this algebraic perspective, which is um, in fact Hamilton, based in the Hamiltonian formalism. So this is based on uh, Godard models and you've heard last week uh, about Godard models from Volker Schomerus. So I'll just recall what these are. So uh, I think he talked about Godard models for a specific Lie algebra, the conformal algebra. I'll, I'll take a general Lie algebra, semi-simple Lie algebra over C. And then uh, to write down the Hamiltonian and the Lax connection, it's useful to fix some dual bases with respect to the uh, some non-degenerate body in the form on the Lie algebra. And then the Lax matrix takes this form. Uh, so what I A at site I here is just, it's a copy of the basis elements for the Lie algebra G, but attached to the site Z I. So for example, in here, uh, we have um, the basis, uh, which I call I A and then bracket one at the side Z one. So this is a basis of this copy of the Lie algebra at this side. So you take this sum uh, over these basis elements at side I tensored with some auxiliary factor. So this is an auxiliary copy of the Lie algebra. And then you have the spectral parameter dependence in the denominator. So what this satisfies is easy to check. It satisfies this um, canonical Poisson bracket relation with an R matrix here. So this is the classical R matrix R one, two, of Z and W. Um, and um, well, the way to construct the Hamiltonians of this model is you take the trace of L squared, so in SLN. Uh, but in general, what you do is you take the, the bilinear form of the lax connection with itself. And in fact, you have a bunch of Hamiltonians by taking the residue of this expression at the various sites. So these are called the Godard Hamiltonians at HI, and they have this explicit form, which you've seen in Folker's talk last week. So uh, what I want to emphasize here is that wh why am I interested in Godard models is because uh, in the finite case, there are many uh, finite dimensional integrable systems which can be constructed out of a Godard model. So they're more precisely, they can be obtained as representations of a Godard model. So to give an example of this, um, let me show you how the so-called Neumann model is constructed. So, so um, so in fact, um, most of these theories are constructed from some sort of generalization of the Godard model. And I'll uh, tell you a bit more about this later. So 
typically what you want to do is, for example, increase the number, the order of a pole in the lax matrix. So this, this lax matrix has simple poles at the ZIs. These are the mark points, but later you, you'll want to construct a good R models with higher order singularities. And so, for example, if you introduce a um, second order uh, singularity at infinity, what you get is an extra piece in the lax matrix like this. So this is the lax matrix we had before. But then what you can do is uh, introduce an extra pole at infinity, which introduces this extra constant term in the Lax matrix. And so in what way is the Neumann model a Godin model? So uh, what I want to do is apply some representation to these, um, to these factors here. And specifically at the site i, the basis EHF, uh, I send them to the following expressions. So this is um, uh, an expression in terms of uh, some canonic canonically conjugate uh, coordinates x and p. So there are n of them. And I represent the, uh, the algebra generators at site i in terms of the canonical variables at site i in this way. So it's, it's well known that these form a representation of SL2. And so uh, this thing I've written here is representing the abstract generators in terms of concrete phase space variables. And at infinity, you just uh, have this. Um, so it turns out that the copy of the Lie algebra at infinity is actually an abelian copy. It doesn't satisfy the Lie algebra relations of SL2. It's just an abelian Lie algebra. And so you just send the generator E at infinity to a half and then everything else to zero. And then the auxiliary factor you just represent in terms of uh, two by two matrices. And then what you get out of it is this um, concrete Lax matrix, which if you've worked with the Neumann model before, you'll recognize this as the Lax matrix of the Neumann model. So uh, in the same way, many uh, inter finite dimensional integrable systems come about as representations of, the, uh, of some Godin model. And this is because these integrable systems have uh, a lax matrix which satisfies this kind of algebra. Okay. So um, what I want to do now is explain how if you replace the finite algebra G by an affine algebra, then what you can start to describe is, is field theories. So everything up to now has been finite dimensional, but what we're interested in is field theories, or what I'm interested in is field theories. So, uh, what you start with is uh, taking the uh, untwisted um, affine Katsumudi algebra associated with some finite dimensional Lie algebra G. So uh, I pick a basis uh, of this algebra and some dual basis. So a basis is built out of these loops generators, central extension and a derivation element. And then the dual basis is the um, loop generators with the negative um, loop. And then derivation element is dual to the central element and vice versa. Okay. So the idea is that um, you can realize many two-dimensional integrable field theories or, or rather their lax connections as representations of um, the lax connection of some Godin model or the lax matrix of some Godin model associated to some affine Katsumudi algebra. So this was first realized by Fagan Frankel in the example of KDV, but then it was later understood that this works much more generally. So the broad picture is the following. So you start with, let's take the simple example of a Godin model with simple poles. And what I'm doing now is I'm summing over these dual basis elements of the affine Katsumudi algebra. So this is really an infinite sum. And uh, what I want to do is represent these again, in, as, as I did before, to obtain the lax connection of some field theory. So what you do is you represent the copy of the Katsumudi algebra at site i um, um, as follows. So let me write out this sum here over the uh, infinite uh, basis element a twiddle explicitly. So I have the sum over the uh, central element and derivation element. Remember that the derivation element is paired with the central element. And then you have the sum over the loop generators. So what I do on the auxiliary factor, this factor here is I represent k as zero. So this is sent to zero. Uh, D is sent to minus i d sigma. So sigma is just some coordinates on the circle. And then uh, this guy I send to um, I A times uh, E to the minus I N stigma. So this is a representation of the auxiliary copy of the Casmini algebra at level zero. And then on the, um, on the side, on the copies of the Lie algebra at site I, I this, it doesn't matter what I send this to because K is sent to zero here, but these guys are just sent to some levels. Specifically, I send it to I times some level K I. And then what I get out of this is a connection, um, which is Lie algebra valued. And um, it's this here, what you can think of it as is just the formal distribution on the circle. So it's a Fourier decomposition of a field on the circle. So the connection is valued in Lie algebra valued fields and it has some level Ki, which came from representing the central element. 
So this is just representing this uh, numerator in the lax connection. But if you represent all of these at each site, what you get out of it is, um, so the, the central term, what it produces is a one form, uh, because I have this dz here, times uh, d sigma. So this one form will be crucial later. It, it will be one of the inputs of the 4D transcendence theory. And uh, what you get out of these fields here is just uh, the lax connection that people usually consider in these field theories. So notice that um, here the lax connection is multiplied by omega. So in fact, its poles are exactly where the zeros of omega are. So this will be important later also in the 4D transcendence theory. So in other words, uh, my one form here, I obtain just uh, by realizing the central element by some numbers. And so I get this uh, one form, meromorphic one form. And then uh, its zeros are exactly where the lax connection, um, the usual lax connection has um, poles here. So specifically, if my one form has simple zeros, then my connection will have simple poles at these zeta i's. Okay. So um, the lax connection of the uh, Godin model in the affine case satisfies the same Poisson algebra relations as this one. It's just that you now have a, an arm matrix which is based on the affine Katsmudi algebra generators. Uh, but everything works out the same. And if you represent it, um, as I described here. So if you represent your Godin lax matrix in this way, what you get out of it is that the lax connection uh, that people usually consider satisfies this non ultra local lax algebra. So this just comes out uh, for free from the Godin construction by applying some representation to the Godin lax matrix. So these RNS here are just this skew symmetric and symmetric part of some R matrix, which depends explicitly on this phi here, which is just the component of the, the one form omega. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, so you say that it realizes representation of Katsumudi, yes? So mm -hmm. it, it means that uh, the bracket in Katsumudi algebra will map in what, in Poisson brackets in, yeah, in exactly. the model. Yes, so exactly. you, and you read of uh, the, this um, relation between Fourier modes uh, from Poisson brackets just making Fourier expansion for fields. Yes, exactly. So maybe if I give an example, it will become clear. So let me give the PCM as an example. So I claim that the PCM can be obtained from this Godin model, which has a double pole at the origin and a double pole at infinity. So I explained before that the Neumann model requires a double pole at infinity, which introduces this constant piece in the lax matrix. If I also introduce a double pole at zero, what I get is not just one over Z term, but one over Z squared term as well. And so uh, these Lie algebra generators here, they satisfy some uh, canonical relations. So th these are just bases of the Katsumudi algebra, but they're addressed by some label, so some subscript here. So the subscript zero is, is in some honest copy of the Lie algebra G, but then uh, the subscript one is in some copy of the Lie algebra, which is multiplied by epsilon naught, some nilpotent object. So in other words, this, this subspace is an abelian Lie algebra, and it has an adjoint action of this guy. So the Lie brackets of, of this, um, the algebra you can easily write down. And I'm saying that uh, the uh, fields of the PCM are realizations of these commutation relations. Okay, so specifically I'm saying that if you take the commutator of this guy with that guy, you find the same thing as if you to compute the Poisson bracket of the time component of the current J in the PCM and the uh, spatial component of the current in the PCM. Okay. And okay. so yeah. you formally introduce one more space. So now you it is, uh, I think it's a moody times uh, some, some uh, another space. Exactly, yeah, this space you mean here. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. So so it's sort of like a truncation of a, um, it's a, it's a truncation of a loop algebra over the Katz moody algebra. So basically you take a loop algebra, but you just chop it off at degree one. So, and then this guy becomes a billion because it, it's commutator would be epsilon squared, but this is zero. Yeah, so it's sort of an extension of the Katsumudi algebra, um, but that's just because the, the site is a double pole at the origin. If you take, so you can deform the PCM to get the so-called Young-Baxter model, and then this double pole splits into two simple poles, and then you have honest Katsumudi algebras at both sides. So I'm just showing you an example which is more familiar, but that requires introducing double poles. This is G, twi G twiddle is what? It's the affine Katsumudi algebra. It was this, um, Untwisted affine Katsumudi algebra. And in terms of the PCM, what's the central charge? Well, um, the, P the PCM, uh, the central charge uh, for the, the 
copy at the origin is is one here. There's a one here. In fact, it it has two central charges because there's one for this guy and one for that guy. Uh, in fact, the it's the one for um, this guy, which is central charge one, and then the one at the uh, the simple pole one is central charge zero. So there's there's a pair of central charges for each of these two copies of the Lie algebra. Yeah, and then the central charge at infinity is one as well. But Isaac, can I also ask about central charges uh, and try to connect with um, old stuff? You of course know the classical textbook, Fadiev and Tachtejan, yes. Hamiltonian methods, and yes. there is the last chapter about Lie algebraic structure of integrable models. And they start, I don't think they pronounce words about cut smooth algebra, but they have um, uh, this current algebra, so which is exactly yeah. Lie algebra times Laurent polynomial, Laurent yes. series, yes? yes? So it is like Katsumudi without a central extension. Yes. And then they wrote some general uh, Lie Poisson brackets. Uh, and then they say that, okay, if you write it in particular representation, if you take factorization, go to some, let's say, quadrant orbits, you will produce many different integrable models. Yes. So, so it, uh, what, what is there a, so what is a serious uh, difference? Is there a serious difference from that uh, um, story? Here you add so, two central yeah. charges somehow, yes. yeah? Yes. So, um, I don't, I don't remember exactly which part of the book you're referring to, but I think uh, the main focus here is on non ultra local models. So this is the key point. So what Godin models provide is sort of a general framework for understanding the origin of these uh, non ultra local models. And the fact that there's multiple levels, it's just coming from the fact that the Godin model has higher order poles at, at the sites. It's not, so, um, I think in, in the PCM, you can see that there are multiple levels because if you look at the plus and brackets of the PCM, you have uh, J1 with J0, it's got, uh, you know, it's, it's got a term which is proportional to J1 and then it's got a delta prime term. Uh, so like this, and then, so you can say this is at level one, but it's not quite a Katsumudi algebra because it, it's two different currents um, or two different components of the same current. And then J1 with J1 is zero, so it's like a zero level. And then J0 with J0 is proportional to J0, which has also got no delta prime, so it's got level zero. So you can sort of see all these levels here in the Poisson brackets of the PCM. Uh, um, is there a way to see delta prime uh, quickly from this construction? Yes. Um, so the reason the delta prime appears here is because, um, let's see. Um, so yeah, take this take this Poisson bracket algebra for the Godin model. I'm claiming this still holds in the affine case. So uh, this affine um, algebra, in fact, if what you can do, if you represent this auxiliary space, so consider the loop generators, then you get IA tensor IA, uh, and then times uh, e to the minus i n sigma, e to the minus i n uh, sigma prime, and then when you sum over n, uh, you get the delta function. So in fact, uh, what you get is the usual R matrix, finite R matrix times a delta function. So this is this is becomes delta of sigma minus sigma prime. But these guys get represented as differential operators, as we just saw. So the differential operator will act on the delta function to produce a delta prime. And then you have the other two terms which come from the commutator of the field part with the R matrix. So there are both delta prime terms from the derivative acting on the R matrix, and there are field terms or delta terms coming from the fields commutator with the R matrix. Does that answer your question? So the delta prime terms come from the fact that the lax connection has, uh, it's a connection. So it has a D segment which will act on the R matrix in the commutator and it produces these delta prime terms. Sorry, and the fact that the um, uh, charges are in evolution now automatically follows from this first representation. I mean, this the one that looks like no, ultra-low. It no, it's not automatic. Uh, so, uh, it, I mean, this is still a, a difficult problem. Um, and in fact, in the field theory case, um, well, for, for, for the non ultra local theories with delta primes, it's, it's very well known that um, there's this notorious problem of generating these integrals of motion from the monogamy. The monogamy doesn't have a well defined Poisson bracket. And so, one way around this is actually you can at least build local integrals of motion. And the way you build them is as certain polynomials in the Lax matrix. Uh, and which you, which you then integrate over sigma. 
So these are local densities. They're local in the fields because they're built out of polynomials of the Lax matrix. And the Hamiltonian is one of these local integrals of motion. So there is a systematic construction of these local integrals of motion due to Evans, Hassan, McCain, Mountain, uh, which in fact works more generally for any affine Godin model. But it's not, it's not automatic from the, from the original bracket. That was your question. So it, it doesn't yeah. follow automatically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And, and this algebra that you get, this is the most general Maya algebra or? It's, yeah, this uh, is, um, well, it's the general Maya algebra with uh, non-dynamical R matrices and of this special, so you can get other forms like this. So I've shown you uh, the case of, for a standard Godin model, but you can get uh, R matrices of more general form. Like for example, coset sigma models don't have this R matrix. They have a, an R matrix twisted by some automorphism. This comes out from considering another class of Godin models, which have a equivariant lax matrix under some automorphism. Yeah. But you can get, I mean, all, all the, Integrable sigma models that we know, and lots of integrable field theories like the sine Gordon model, total field theories, these all come out of this construction. Yeah. Okay. And then, so I was saying that this Lax matrix, if you represent it in this way, which which just amounts to saying that the Lie brackets um, relation for these generators of this algebra, they're just the same as the relations satisfied by the PCM field. Then you get um, this lax this usual lax matrix of the PCM, and uh, at the front you get this one form, which is the PCM um, for the the one form for the PCM. Okay. So, are there any other questions on Godin before I move to the four digit? Sorry, if may you I say something? The... Yeah. Sure. Oh, sorry. Ah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Davide? Sorry, someone was asking. Yes. So, uh, okay. Or, okay, I can ask. Uh, so, in, in the initial uh, formulation, uh, so you can uh, construct transfer matrix, right? Yes. And is it uh, the same as uh, if you take PCM and uh, construct it there, or it's what you probably replied just now? Um, yeah, so what you can do is construct the transfer matrix from this Lax matrix. That's what you usually do. Um, yes. But the Poisson bracket of this is, is not well defined. Uh, so. Yeah, and if you start from uh, Gaudin yeah. model. So if you start from Gaudin model, there's, I mean, um, so there's, there's another, another, another natural set of charges you can build, which are ha local Hamiltonians, local integrals of motion. So that, these ones you can naturally build from um, a non local algebra. So I said, there's this construction of uh, Evans, Hassan, McCain, Mountain, which allows you to construct integrals of motion, uh, which are local in the fields. Uh, the monogamy, as far as I know, in classical Godin models is just still badly defined. It's not, it's not a good object to look at. And another reason it's not a good object to look at is it doesn't actually contain the Hamiltonians usually. The Hamiltonians are these local charges, which are not part of the, of the expand. You can't expand the transfer matrix and, and hope to get the Hamiltonians out of it. They're, in the PCM, for example, they're not in the expansion of the, of the, of the monogamy. The, the Hamiltonians you, you just get by essentially trace of L squared. So you take um, this quantity and you take the trace. Uh, so this should depend on Z. You take the trace uh, of this squared and then you integrate over sigma. And, and then you can take the residue at the poles of this Lax matrix. So at zeta one or zeta two, or at one or minus one, and you get some quantities which when you add them up or when you take their difference gives you the Hamiltonian of the PCM. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Okay. But uh, sorry, if you take, is there a notion of auxiliary space representation in, in Gaudin model? If you take some weird uh, representation auxiliary space, you want to get uh, Hamiltonian eventually. In the monogamy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this I don't know. Uh, at least in the fundamental, you don't get it, uh, but maybe. I, I because normally, I mean, if it's uh, uh, SU4, uh, then you need uh, anti-symmetric representation to find Hamiltonian. But the thing is that you have this other way of building the Hamiltonian, as well as an infinite tower of local integrals of motion. And, um, and these all commute with the monogamy in some um, at least in some nice cases. So the monogamy certainly is conserved. Uh, 
and because it commutes with the Hamiltonian, but whether or not you can get the Hamiltonian from it is sort of irrelevant because you can get it by some other means. Yeah. Can you please repeat how, how do you, how you get the, uh, the the Hamiltonian? Yeah, um, so the Hamiltonian is given by, uh, so you take the trace of uh, this Lax matrix here and then um, squared and then um, integrated over D sigma over the circle. And then you take uh, the difference of the residue at one minus the residue um, at minus one. And this is the Hamiltonian of the PCM. So one and minus one, remember, are poles of this Lax matrix because uh, by construction. And um, if you take this, um, this expression, you work it out, you find it's J sigma squared plus J tau squared. And this, this formula actually works more generally. In general, the, the Hamiltonian of a general Godard model is always going to be built out of a sum of residues of the trace of the Lax squared at the poles of the Lax matrix, where the, the coefficients are plus or minus one, depending on the, the model. And the momentum you get by plus, take the plus, it gives you the momentum. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so now I'll switch to a very different uh, perspective, but on the same story. And as you'll see, there's a very close... may, Sorry, be yeah. before you, you start yes. another chapter, yes. which looks very interesting, but may, may I ask you something which is probably silly, but so uh, how, how do you quantize this? I mean, what, uh, so um, what does this uh, classical Yambaster becomes? Because I remember all papers, yeah. In which, uh, so the quantum version of, uh, for not, we are talking about non ultra local yes, models, yes, am I yes, right? Yes. So, for those cases, at least for yeah. somehow simpler or more complicated, so with different features, I remember that uh, you have a modification of the Jan Baxter, a sort of yes. Jan Baxter equation at the quantum level. So, okay, can you say something so about this that? is a it's a very long story, um, but I, I can summarize maybe so, um. I, I don't want to, to, to trouble you. No, we can well, discuss about this also yeah, yeah. in private. So, uh, so I want just to, to make no, let's go in what let's I remember go in what, what is new. So as I said, the monogamy is not well defined for these models. And so, um, uh, so how to say. Um, well, if you want, we if you stay at the level of Godin model, right? Yeah. So, so at the level of a Godin model, I can tell you the quantization is quite natural. You just basically turn this into a commutator. So the point is that if you quantize linear brackets in an integrable system, the brackets stay linear. So the R matrix does not get quantized. Okay. So the claim is that uh, if you if you try to quantize the Godin model, you can naturally quantize it in this way. I just told you. Just this becomes a commutator. Uh, but then the question, which is still difficult, is how do you construct uh, integrals of motion for this algebra? So um, as someone asked, uh, this doesn't automatically follow from the fact that the right-hand side is a commutator. So there's some complicated uh, work to do in the, in the quantum theory to show that there are some quantities which are built out of the Lax matrix which commute with each other, and of which one of these is the Hamiltonian. So I think the story you're thinking of is this um, a story of trying to put uh, these non local local theories on a lattice, and then. Um, but I mean, uh, so, sorry, up to up to some problems is uh, finding Hamiltonian yeah. transfer matrix is uh, generates you. That, 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 that would be the, the end yeah, point okay. of my of my question somehow. Okay. Yes, that, but, but, but Nikolai jumped to, to to the end. Yes, somehow. But let's say. Uh, in, where this works is the case when these two terms are, ab are absent. Then you have this Poisson bracket of T with T. And this is the, the quantum inverse scattering method. T with T is the commutator of little r with T, T, right? And then you quantize this to the RTT relations. Okay, but this is not available here. So exactly. As this David is... was mentioning, there are generalizations of this algebra where it's... you have like RTST equals TSTR. Yeah, but I don't remember the classical. My, my, my question yeah. was also quite simple. I don't remember. The, yeah. the classical counterpart. I, I somehow yeah. remember vaguely because yes. it goes back to my yeah. 
to my yeah. youth somehow. Yes. <laughs> but anyhow, so, so, uh, so Bagley, so, yeah. I, I, but I, I don't want to, to, yeah. to uh, I'm, I'm interested, we can discuss in private. So, so because so, I don't remember the classical counterpart of yeah. the so-called bread the ambassador, which has many, as you, yeah. as you know, um, uh, yeah. as many, many features, also categorical, uh, uh, approaches and uh, because yeah, sure. this is the problem with uh, this uh, ba basically physical is the derivative of delta prime yes, this yeah. is the, the uh, sorry the derivative of delta this, this is the point which generates uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, but, but it's very common in uh, basically it's uh, it's a feature of all uh, physically of all uh, sigma models once you want uh, yes. to, to quantize sigma models uh, yes. and this is quite reasonable no you yes, agree? Yes. so you 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 should you should uh, you should face this uh, this, this this problem as yes. far as i remember so but could I still uh, understand uh, this clear point? So uh, it looks like you have another formulation in terms of Gadan model, and this one you can quantize uh, in five yeah, seconds. Yeah, you can quantize, right? but the question is uh, still how to build integrals of motion. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that the monogamy is sort of difficult to quantize. Um, and there is this. Even at the go, go, Godin level. Well, uh, I mean, this is a, I'm probably going to. Uh, and this is a very interesting question, and uh, I think it's it's just not known how to quantize the integrals of motion of classical Godin. So in classical Godin, you can build an infinite family of integrals of motion which are local. The monogamy is also conserved, or rather, I should say, the trace of the monogamy is conserved. Uh, the monogamy itself is not well defined, but um, all these charges, there is no um, sort of systematic way to quantize them yet. But the hope is that by working universally within this framework of Godin, you ha you can sort of uh, obtain some systematic way of quantizing the charges in all these models because this is there's some uni unifying framework behind all of these um, non local local theories. They all originate as representations of Godin models. And right, I don't understand that, but let's okay. go on. Yeah, yeah, just just a, bri a very uh, uh, brief note. Uh, probably you can also think uh, heuristically to go the other way, since as you said, the Godin seems to be more ge more general as far as I understand. Uh, probably the most general, then you, you, you can uh, go to some model we, we know how to quantize and understand okay. how to write it in terms of Godin, and then you have some residue yes. or something like this. So, but yeah. this is very, you know, just sure, uh, sure. just words, I understand that. Uh, no, no, well, I mean, one case where you can do what you're saying is KDV. KDV, we know how to quantize, and exactly. it's, a Godin, it's a Godin exactly. model, and there's- KDV, there's a... you, you know, the lattice, everything, yes. you know, you, you, everything is, yeah. so it's not so easy, but anyhow, now everything is under control, and uh, yeah. you know but how to- In fact, you can even quantize in the continuum. This is BLZ, so we don't even need to go to the lattice. Yes, and although in the continuum you have a lot of, uh, yeah, you, you have a lot of divergences. Now use uh, conformal yeah. field theory, and then if you want to go, KDV is okay, same yeah. is a little bit uh, trickier. So conformal field theory is a very powerful tool, but you have to make some. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I think we are uh, going deep okay, maybe at the into break. discussion yes. ground. Let's, uh, okay, so. So this other perspective is uh, completely different, apparent, I mean, on, on the surface, but actually deep down it's very closely related to what I just said. And I hope you'll see this as I, as I explain this alternative. So this was initially proposed by Costello um, and then further worked out by Costello, Witt and Yamazaki. So in these two papers, what they looked at is uh, integrable lattice models. And then recently it was realized by Costello and Yamazaki that in fact, the same procedure also allows you to construct integrable field theories. So the, the action is the same, but the difference uh, with the lattice models is rather than putting line defects as they did uh, in these two papers, or in this series of papers, you put surface defects. So more precisely, the, the theory is defined on, on sigma, which is the two dimensional world sheet, which I'll take to be R2, cross CP1, which is the uh, spectral plane of the, of the theory. So the whole thing is called X. And then you have this one form omega wedging the, for the 3D uh, Chern Simons form or three, you know, three, Chern Simons three form. So this omega I want to stress is really the same as the one which appeared in the Godin model as a representation of the central charges. So now what we have is this um, uh, Chern Simons one form. Uh, and um, in fact, because omega has a DZ component, uh, you can automatically drop the DZ component of the, um, of the connection one form A here. So you just have a three component connection. So it's like a partial connection on, on X. And um, what, what the goal will be to, uh, to turn this into the lax matrix. So I'll explain later how essentially you want to get rid of this term. You want to set it to zero. And what you'll be left with is a, a, two uh, a, a lax connection with two, le two legs, or I should say a connection with two legs. And it depends on sigma. So it depends on Z as well, but you want to make it meromorphic as well. So the goal will be to turn this into the lax matrix. Okay. 
So of course, Costello Yamazaki have a, a proposal for how to do this. I want to give a different perspective on the same story. So uh, first, uh, let's think about the action. So the, the, the Lagrangian, in principle, it looks like it's quite singular because it has this one over Z minus Z item. So this omega has singularities at these surface defects. So it's singular at R2 cross any of these Zi's. And so the question is, well, uh, does this action even make sense? And so it turns out that for simple poles, although omega is singular on these surface defects, it's the, the Lagrangian is actually locally integrable near the defect because dz wedge dz bar of a simple pole uh, is actually bounded. So you can integrate this thing. So, um, so the action is well defined, but now the, the question is, um, is it a gauge theory? So the, is it invariant under gauge transformations? And what I want to stress here is that I'm concerned about finite gauge transformations. So usually people consider infinitesimal gauge transformations and it's not too hard to show the action is invariant under such infinites infinitesimal gauge transformations but I really want to consider general gauge transformation, large ones. So uh, the behavior of the uh, action un under such a gauge transformation reproduces the same action plus two new terms. So this is familiar if you're familiar with 3D churn Simons. So you have the same two terms popping up, but with an omega wedge uh, in front of both. So in particular for 3D churn Simons, what you usually do is you consider the, the action on a three manifold with a boundary uh, and then what you do to get rid of these terms is you impose boundary conditions on the gauge field um, to make, uh, you say that it vanishes at the boundary. And uh, what this ensures is that the action is uh, not quite gauge invariant, but gauge invariant up to two pi integer multiple. So this is fine because uh, what you ultimately consider is uh, e to the i times the action. And so this is actually uh, what you plug into the path integral, which is therefore gauge invariant. And so everything is fine. So your theory is gauge invariant in the, in the path integral. So I want to stress that in this story, actually, it will be gauge invariant on the nose. So this will not be here in the, in the present story. So the 4D transcendence action will just be gauge invariant. Okay. So and what I want to first do is, is rewrite these two terms that come out of the variation as local terms on the surface defect. So these are integrals over the whole space, but I want to sort of localize them on the surface defect. So I need to introduce some notation to rewrite it in, in this way. So first I'll define the defect Lie group, which is basically a copy of the Lie group for each of the, of the ZIs. Okay, so it's a direct product of the, of the copies of the Lie group for each side. And because I've already mentioned um, these so um, these uh, theories with higher order poles, if uh, the ZI, for example, was a higher order pole, then you'd need some sort of extension of the group, which includes uh, nilpotent variables. So this would be some jet extension of the group. So I won't talk about this in, in this uh, talk, but this whole procedure works for general omega with general poles of any order. But in the simple poll case, it's very simple. You just put a copy of the group at each site. It's Lie algebra is just gonna be a copy of the Lie algebra at each site. And then, so this I'll call the defect Lie algebra and the defect group. And the defect Lie algebra has a very natural bilinear pairing on it. So you just take the bilinear pairing at each of the sites. So you pair the copy of the Lie algebra element at each site, and then you just um, sum them with weighted by the residues of the one form omega. So these were residue, this is the residue at X of omega, okay. So this is a natural bilinear form. And again, this extends to the case of higher order poles. So uh, another notation I'll use a lot is this uh, yota, which is an embedding. So it's just the embedding of the surface defect into the total space, okay? So my defect, remember, is just some disjoint union of, of these copies of sigma, and they lie in, in X at different, at different points, uh, which I call Zi's, and this Z underline is the collection of all the Zi's, okay? So if you start from, let's say, um, a group valued field like the gauge transformation parameter. So this is living on X and valued in the group G. But if you pull it back to the surface defect, meaning if you just restrict it to the surface defect, what you get, you get a, a function valued in G, but living on the surface defect. The surface defect is just a disjoint union of copies of sigma. So in the end, what this amounts to is just uh, um, multiple functions on sigma valued in G, or you can gather these into one function valued in the defect group. So this is why I introduced this defect group because if I take a function on the total space and I restrict it to my surface defects, I get a function in the defect group. Same thing for Lie algebra valued functions on the total space. If I restrict them to the defect, I just get a, 
uh, Li algebra valued one form, but the Li algebra is the defect Li algebra. So it's a one form on sigma valued in the defect Li algebra. Okay. So this is just notation, but uh, the claim is you can show. Um, so this this piece is easy. This one requires some work, but you can show that both terms which we had in the variation of the action before can be rewritten as local integrals over the surface defects. So the first one is an honest integral over sigma of the pullback of the gauge field and, the, and this uh, group gauge transformation parameter to the, to the defect. And then um, this other term, you just have to have a tensor with an interval. So this is a typical vesemin witten term, but now it's a vesemin witten term for the, for the group GZ hat, oh, sorry, GZ. So it's for the defect group. In particular, this is the bilinear pairing on the defect group. So it's just a vesemin witten term for the defect group. Okay, so this is the variation. And so now we want to sort of get rid of these two terms. We want to impose some boundary conditions on the gauge field and on the gauge transformation parameter to make these two things vanish, these two terms vanish. So there's a very uh, natural way to do this, uh, which is to choose an isotropic subalgebra of GZ, the defect Lie algebra. So isotropic just means that if you take any two elements of this Lie algebra and take the inner product with themselves, uh, you get zero. So the the inner product of any two elements of this subalgebra is just zero. So what this means is that uh, if I take my gauge field A not to be valued in, the, in this uh, K, but if I take its pullback, which remember is valued, um, so the pullback is a field which is valued in GZ, but now I demand, that's, this is my boundary condition, I demand that on the boundary, it's not living in GZ, but actually in this subgroup or in subalgebra. Okay, so it's valued in this isotropic subalgebra. And I do the same thing for the gauge transformation parameter. Uh, of course, this is uh, necessary because I want to preserve this boundary condition. So I demand that my gauge transformation parameter also, when I restrict them, restrict them to the defect, they're valued in this, uh, the group associated to the isotropic subalgebra K. So uh, this is a condition you impose on the fields at the boundary or at the defect. And uh, what, what this guarantees uh, is that these two terms vanish essentially um, by definition of isotropy because this is valued in K by assumption, the boundary condition, this is also valued in K, and then the inner product of K with K is zero. So this term disappears. And then here, everything is valued in K. K is a, is a subalgebra. So when you take the Lie bracket, you get something in K as well. And so therefore the whole thing vanishes. Okay, so this is a simple way to make the action gauge invariant. You just demand that your fields, when you restrict them to the defects, they, they are valued in this isotropic subalgebra. Is there some uh, constructive uh, description of this uh, isotropic subalgebra? There are many examples usually. So one way to build them is using an R matrix. So you choose an R matrix on the defect the algebra. So some endomorphism of, um, of the defect the algebra. And um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm forgetting the details, but you can build a Lie algebra out of this, which will be a natural isotropic subalgebra of this isotropy following from the skew symmetry of the R matrix. Um, and the fact that it's a subalgebra follows from the Young Baxter equation. So you can build subalgebras quite naturally from R matrices on the defect Lie algebra. But there are many other, other ways to build subalgebras. I and mean, it depends. Many, many such subalgebras. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They're not unique. Yeah, exactly, not unique. It's and about some maximals. Uh, yeah, so it has to be maximal. So this will be important later. So, okay, so it's, it's really a Lagrangian subalgebra to tell you the truth uh, straight away. So, so, so far, yeah, sorry. Will it be unique? No, 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 there are many choices. This is maximal. Um, I mean, you can build maximal things for different choices of our matrices. Mm. They're, not, they're not unique at all. Uh, okay. Sorry, and this is all for complex, the complex groups and algebras, yeah? No, you can put reality conditions. Everything is real. I haven't told you about reality conditions, but essentially if, if the site ZI is conjugate to another site, then the Lie algebra, there's an automorphism that sends one copy of the Lie algebra to the other and the whole, the, this defect Lie algebra is a real Lie algebra. Um, and but then I, that you don't necessarily have a Lagrangian, right? It can be even uh, odd dimensional, for example. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, very good. So I'm assuming that either the number of sites is even or uh, the, but this is counting multiplicities or that the dimension of the Lie algebra is even. So the dimension of the Lie algebra should, should be even, in which case, if you take dim G to be even, then the defect Lie algebra is gonna be even dimensional. 
And the other thing you can do is take an odd, odd dimensional Lie algebra or whatever dimensional, and then take an even number of sites uh, counting multiplicities, then it's even. But yeah, you're right. This has to be an even subalgebra. Even dimensional. Is that, that's what you're saying, right? Yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah. But but this is, yeah, did, sure. you know, and can we find a point to stop in the next few sure. minutes for coffee break? Yes. So I'll summarize this and then um, and then we can stop. Yeah. Great. Two more minutes. Mm -hmm. So what I try to argue here is that uh, if you impose such boundary conditions on the gauge field, it's naturally the action naturally becomes gauge invariant. Okay. So this is essentially what I tried to show above. So. Um, to summarize what we've done in maybe a more mathematical uh, point of view. So this will be important to sort of motivate the next part. So uh, by imposing these boundary conditions, what we've done is we've constructed uh, what's called a pullback. So essentially we've taken bulk fields. So the bulk connection A, which is valued in the Lie algebra and the bulk uh, gauge transformation parameter valued in the Lie, in the Lie group. And what we've said is that uh, we want their restriction to the defect which are things valued now in the isotro in the uh, defect Lie algebra and defect Lie group, we want them to be uh, valued in K. So in other words, we have some uh, defect fields that we like, and we want the restriction of the bulk fields to the defect to be to coincide with these defect fields. So uh, by this pullback construction, what it does is it tells you basically that you want to look at fields in the bulk, which have the property that when you restrict them to the defect, they are identified with these boundary field or defect fields, which are special in the, in the sense that they're K valued. And so um, imposing to, the boundary, uh, sorry? Up to gauge transformation. So you can tra gauge transform this and it should coincide with the uh, restriction of the bulk field. Or, or so you're anticipating what I'm about to say after the break. So this is not the most natural way to do things because what we're doing here is we're identifying gauge fields, which is not natural. So uh, what you should do uh, is actually uh, impose boundary conditions up to up to a gauge transformation indeed and this is not what this pullback construction does the pull i'm just telling you uh, if you just impose gauge conditions like strongly or strictly then uh, this is what's afforded to you by the pullback construction uh, so you have this this groupoid and you do a pullback of this groupoid uh, in this way and what you get is just fields which restrict to the boundary to fields which are k valued um, so uh, remember this is k-valued, so this condition is just saying that the, the restriction of the bulk gauge field to the defect is k-valued, but uh, what you've just said is true, it's not really the most natural thing to do. So after the break, what I want to do is, is explain another better way to impose boundary conditions, which in fact um, imposes them up to, up to gauge transformations. Yeah, so this is a good point to stop. Okay, great. So let's uh, stop, and well, if you have one quick question before the break. Yeah, I have a quick question. So, uh, Castelli and Masaki, they already had this condition, right? That the, there should be a Lagrangian yeah, boundary yeah. condition and so on. So, what, what, what is your statement here? I mean, you say it's gauge invariance. So you're proving yeah, th that, that this is the new thing. Yeah, we're, we're proving it's gauge invariance for such gauge transformations. For, sorry, for such boundary conditions. So, this is something which they, they uh, considered only uh, for infinitesimal gauge transformations, but now I'm, I'm claiming it's just gauge invariance um, for all gauge transformations. Yeah, so this is new. But then the next part will be new as well. It's this new perspective on how to impose the boundary conditions. Yeah. But uh, in Costello Mazaki, they didn't consider large gauge transformations, just ones which are infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, let's. Can I ask one more question? Sorry. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, what if instead of asking for gauge invariance, you ask you ask for it to be invariant up to a multiple of two pi? Do you get some extra freedom? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about this. Uh, so the reason we consider these um, boundary conditions is because they're the natural ones which produce all the known signal models. Uh, in fact, an interesting question is what are other types of boundary conditions? This is a very interesting question. And there could be, as you say, boundary conditions which actually don't, uh, don't make the, the action gauge invariant, but up to only a multiple of two pi. This is possible, um, but I haven't thought about this. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, and also, by the way, in some models, these kind of shifts, discrete shifts, they are related to uh, discrete Hoft anomalies and so on. So, I mean, even in the models uh, which have some physical consequence, you know, so even yeah. in models which are invariant up to 2 pi Km, 
that's again up with some boundary conditions, right? And if you yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. switch the boundary conditions, that might not be an integer anymore. Like if you put like yes, you unbundles that's or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so in the usual story, you can put your gauge field to zero at the boundary, and then you get so that the action is invariant up to a multiple of two pi. Um, so even when you impose boundary conditions, this is true. Yeah, the, the action is not quite gauge invariant. But um, it, here we were considering this class of boundary conditions because they're the ones of most interest. Um, but it's an open question to find out if there are other gauge transformations. And potentially, you could relax this gauge invariance on the nose to a gauge invariance up to a multiple of two pi years. Okay, good. So then we go to coffee break and uh, we resume in 25 past your local hour. Okay. I guess you stop recording. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So before the break, I was saying that um, the pull, the um, imposing boundary conditions you can think more abstractly as uh, this pullback construction, and um, as it was pointed out, in fact, what this does is it impose, imposes quite unnaturally that the gauge field restricted to the defect should be equal to another gauge field. But equality of gauge field is not a very natural thing to do in a gauge theory. You should identify gauge fields up to a gauge transformation. So you don't talk about equality of gauge fields, but rather you relate them by some gauge transformation. And the way to do this mathematically is, is to, instead of imposing the pullback construction, or to using the pullback construction is use the homotopy pullback construction. And what this does in physics words is actually impose the gauge transformation or impose the boundary condition up to a gauge transformation. So um, why, why the homotopy pullback construction from a mathematical point of view, because these are groupoids. So groupoid is just some category with invertible morphisms and um, groupoids have um, equivalence. There's a natural notion of equivalence between groupoids. And if you change one of these groupoids to another groupoid, which is equivalent to it, um, then um, from a physical point of view, there's no difference. But then when you take the pullback, you might get some different groupoid, which is not equivalent to the pullback groupoid. So the pullback construction is not, uh, it's sensitive to the choice of um, groupoid that you choose. It's not an invariant under uh, equivalence of groupoids. So what you do is you, you replace naturally the, the pullback construction by something which does respect equivalences of groupoids. And this is the, what's called the homotopy pullback. Um, so, uh, just to cut this um, abstract discussion short, it turns out that there's a very nice and elegant description of this homotopy pullback. And it does exactly what uh, was suggested. Namely, the field content is no longer just a gauge field, but it's also another field which lives on the defect. And so it's just a field on sigma valued in the defect Lie algebra. And this is what's called the edge mode. And what it does is, it is so essentially it's living in this corner here. It's uh, Oh, sorry, this should be a group. So this is group valued gauge field. And so what it is, is, is just a field uh, which essentially witnesses the equality of the restriction of the bulk field to the defect and this defect field. So the equality is no longer on the nose. It's not a strict equality. It's equality up to gauge transformation by the edge mode. Okay, and so in other words, what you were saying is that we're gonna impose boundary conditions no longer strictly. We're not gonna say that the, the gauge field restricts to something valued in K but it does so up to a gauge transformation. So what's nice is that when you, when you in this framework, the gauge transformation, so what I just described here are the objects of the category, uh, and then these are the morphisms, and um, the morphisms are un unrestricted gauge transformations on the gauge field. There are no longer any conditions on, on this gauge transformation because um, the gauge field is not um, subject to a strict boundary condition. However, the edge mode does have to transform uh, accordingly to preserve this boundary condition. So you can easily check that you can gauge transform on the left by something in K and uh, on the right, you have to transform by something which will cancel the gauge variation of A to preserve this condition. So now we have a theory with um, a bulk field A and a gauge field, uh, sorry, a uh, um, group valued field, which is living on the defect. And what's nice about this perspective is that this um, um, va field valued on, uh, living on the defect will be the two-dimensional field of the integrable field theory. So this will turn into the Lax matrix, and this will become the fields of the 2D theory. It's just a 2D, 2D field valued in some group. Uh, 
So um, to see how this works, let's just first um, rewrite everything um, in terms of these fields. So we start with an action on, on the field A, but the claim is you can actually um, write down an action on the Hamato people back. Uh, and it turns out to be the following. So there's a very natural interpretation of this from the physical point of view. This action, remember, was not gauge invariant. So what you need to do is just add terms which depend on the edge mode, which will cancel the... the Good point and good moment for me to ask a question then. Yeah, okay, it's back on. Oh, recording is back on. Yeah. Is your H hat the same as uh, Kevin's and Masahito's sigma no. hat? Uh, I think my H is more like the H hat of Kevin because oh. you see its property is that if you transform the lax matrix by H, you get something in K. That's exactly what they have. So they have G hat of lax is equal to A which is valued in K at the, on the defect. Mm. Because they impose strict boundary conditions on A and then the lax connection is something which is gauge equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. So this L is what I call A. So for me, the lax connection will be the, the gauge field A. It just will be on the nose, not up to gauge transformation. And then um, the so edge- So you're always working in this gauge where A Z bar is zero. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But so yeah, G hat, it, A hat And so is, in that gauge, you're finding that you effectively have to add this extra edge mode. Um, well, yeah, I don't know if I think of it like that, but the edge mode is just there to impose these boundary conditions weakly. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, so the perspective of Costello Yamazaki is to impose strict boundary conditions on A, but then to say that uh, L is, um, is gauge equivalent to A by something which kills the DZ component, DZ bar component. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah. But H hat here is just some, it's an extension of H to the interval. And basically you start with a field on sigma and you just extend it to sigma cross the interval like you usually do for the resume witten term. So it, it's equal to H on, on the endpoint zero and it's equal to the identity on the other point. Okay. So uh, this action here with the edge mode, this is uh, gauge invariant. So remember that A and H both transform. And so the whole thing is gauge invariant, whereas this piece by itself was not. Okay, so now I want to describe what um, Bogdan was, um, was referring to. So how do we get to the lax connection? So we, at the moment we have a gauge field which has three components and we want to get to a lax connection which has no DZ bar component. The other thing is that uh, A is smooth in Z. So this is smooth in Z. And we want to get to something which is meromorphic in Z. And so uh, to do that, we're gonna have to um, impose some, some restrictions. So the first thing is to get rid of the DZ term. So this will be step one. And then um, the second thing will be to turn uh, the connection into something which is meromorphic in Z. So this will be step two. And then there'll be a, a third step, which is related to expressing the lax matrix in terms of the edge mode. So remember that the lax matrix is really just the gauge connection, but they're related by some boundary condition to the edge mode. And so the, the point will be to try and express the lax connection in terms of the edge mode, because the edge mode will be the field of the 2D theory. And what you want to do is express the lax matrix in terms of the field of the 2D theory. You don't want the lax matrix to be, well, they're related by some constraint and you want to solve this constraint. So the first step is getting rid of the DZ bar component. So um, what we do classically, it's fine to just say, let's get rid of it. Let's, let's consider a subclass of connections which have the property that they don't depend on DZ bar. So you have to ask then what to do in the quantum theory. And so in the quantum theory, I think you might have to do a gauge transformation like Kostela Yamazaki do. But I still think that even if we do a gauge transformation, there's still uh, something to the edge mode. It, the edge mode is something else. It's, it's a field which is living on the, um, on the surface defect and its role is to impose boundary conditions weakly. So, um, yeah. Sure, I mean, if you're, if you're in uh, one gauge and it's a physical field, then it'll be a physical field in another gauge as well. Yeah, so you're saying this is just a choice of gauge? Yeah, and so if in this gauge you're finding something important for the edge yeah, yeah. mode, yeah, 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 then so I mean, ultimately, the G hat must have an interpretation as a, an edge mode in their story. Um, yeah, it so I think that the 
precise relation between this approach and the original construction is not completely clear, but um, I mean, it would be interesting to understand precisely the relationship. Yeah. But so for this talk, I'll, I'll just um, work classically. And what I'm going to do is just restrict to connections which have no DZ component, DZ bar component. And it, correspondingly, what I have to do is restrict my gauge transformations to be such that this thing is zero so that I don't reintroduce any DZ bar components. OK. So uh, when I've restricted to a connection of this form, the churn simons term simplifies a bit uh, because it has just two, two legs. And so this is really just the churn simons of, of L. It's just L D, D by L. And then uh, you have to bear in mind that there's still this constraint, which is part of the sort of part of the data, the field data, sorry. Is there a question? Okay, so um, so what I want to do is uh, to, the, to, to do the second step of uh, um, restricting to meromorphic connections. The way to do this will be to solve part of the equations of motion. So let's work out the equations of motion for this action, bearing in mind that L and H have to be connected in this way. So when you vary the action with respect to L and H, you have to make sure that the variations respect this boundary condition. What you found is that uh, the bulk equations of motion are just telling you that L should be holomorphic. It should not depend on the Z bar. And uh, similarly, the defect equations of motion tell you that the restriction of the lax connection or to the, of the gauge field to the defect should be a flat connection. So this is starting to look a lot like um, the equations of motion for an integrable field theory, which is essentially why 4D Chen Simons was conceived uh, to construct, to, to describe 2D integrable field theory, because it, it produces such equations. But the point is that uh, this, is, uh, this is only an equation for the restriction of the lax connection to the, um, to the defect. It's not, it's not telling you that the lax connection is flat. It's just telling you that its restriction to the defect is flat. Um, and if you recall, um, in this construction, we remove the, the poles or what will become the poles of the lax connection. So the, there were these zeros of omega, which we removed. And so this equation actually tells you that it's holomorphic away from these punctures. So it can have poles at these punctures in particular. So to, um, to, to, to do the second step, uh, all we're going to do is restrict to, to a specific class of solutions of this first bulk equation. So this is an equation for DZ, the Z bar dependence. And we're just going to solve for that uh, Z bar dependence. And uh, we're going to do that by just focusing on a class of solutions. So these will be called admissible solutions. So uh, first of all, they have no legs in, along D sigma and D sigma bar, only in the, in the sigma direction. But they depend on x. And they depend on, on CP1 uh, meromorphically. And they have poles at the zetas, uh, the, at the zeros of omega. And more precisely, the order of the poles should be the same as the order of the zeros of omega. This is imposed by the second condition. So we want omega wedge L to be bounded near the zeros. So this imposes that the, the poles of L are no stronger than the zeros of omega. But then the other important condition we want to impose is the following, uh, which tells you that the curvature of L should also have no stronger poles than omega. Okay. And so um, this is essentially uh, telling you something about this term, because this term could potentially create higher order poles, uh, which would then not cancel with the zeros of omega. But what you want is that the poles created by this commutator are no stronger than the original poles of L. And so this will be um, imposed by, uh, no, this will be um, ensured by imposing this E model condition later. So this is why we get E models out of this construction, or one, one reason we get E models out of this construction. So, um, the nice thing about this second condition is the following, is that if this second condition holds, in particular, if, if the connection is admissible, then it turns out that the uh, boundary equations of motion, or the defect equations of motion, which remember are the flatness of the restriction of lax to the defect, they actually lift to flatness of the lax connection on the bulk. So this is really the honest zero curvature equation for L, and they're equivalent to the defect equations of motion, provided you restrict to, to solutions which have this property these three properties. Okay, So from this point of view, admissibility is required for this, because we want the uh, defect equations to lift to the flatness of some lax connection. So at this point, what we have, um, if we impose the, um, if we restrict to solutions of this bulk equation, then the first term in the action disappears, because it depends on, on dz bar l. Uh, 
And we're just left with the two variation terms or the two edge mode terms. And uh, the nice thing is that the equations of motion are now just the flatness of L. Um, so uh, we don't quite have a, a 2D field theory, a 2D integrable field theory, because uh, although we have flatness of an axe connection, the axe connection is not uh, yet immediately related to the edge mode. It's related implicitly through this um, condition. But what you want is to write the lax as a function of the edge mode. You want to solve solve this uh, this equation um, for lax in terms of, of the edge mode. So this is the third step, solving the constraint. And then when you plug this solution back into here, you'll get the action for the 2D theory. Okay. So to solve this constraint, this is a point where there's some technical um, assumptions that we have to make. Um, so uh, the technical assumption is that uh, we should assume that omega has a double pole at infinity. So uh, this is just saying that there's a, a term which is uh, linear in d sigma. So for example, the PCM, if you remember, it was one over, d, one over z minus one times dz. Uh, this was omega for the PCM. And so this is this double pole at infinity. So you need such a term um, to apply the construction I'm going to describe. But um, in principle, this should be this could be. I mean, this should have a generalization to other omega because we know that uh, other theories which have more general omegas can be um, realized as Godin models um, with such omegas. So there's a Godin model description of these other models, um, and in fact. Um, in the approach of Costello Mazaki, they, they do cosets as well. So cosets can be understood in this way, but uh, in the present uh, language, we, we need to assume this story to make a connection with E models. So under this assumption, what we're going to do is um, basically fix the component of the edge mode at infinity. So at infinity, there are sort of two components to the edge mode, and we're going to fix them by gauge invariance, by using the gauge invariant, or partially fixing the gauge invariance. So specifically, uh, we're going to look at um, the set of poles without infinity, so with infinity removed. And then there's a subgroup of the defect group, which is just, um, well, it's, it's a group which is like constructed like the defect group, but it has no component at infinity. So the claim is by some gauge transformation, you can sort of kill the component of the edge mode at infinity to just be left with an, an edge mode, which now lives in some smaller defect group, which has no component at infinity. There's a corresponding uh, restriction of the full space to the, or you, you have an embedding of the defect without infinity to the full space. So I call this J now. And then the constraint on the lax matrix now looks like this. The, if you pull back the lax connection in the bulk to, the, to this restricted defect, so you don't include infinity in the defect, then the, the edge mode L gauge transforms this to something valued in some isotropic subalgebra, which again has no component at infinity. So Basically, all I've done is just the technicality. I've got rid of the point at infinity using a gauge transformation. I've just used up some of the gauge freedom to, to fix one of the components of the edge mode. OK, so now um, I can describe for you a class of admissible solutions. So to solve conditions A and B of the admissibility condition, I just focus on uh, meromorphic connections, which have simple poles at the zeros of omega. So I'm focusing on omega with simple zeros here. Uh, just with a double pole at infinity only, but the other poles are simple. So, it, uh, so it, all the poles are simple, and then the zeros are, I'm assuming, are simple. So these are simple zeros of omega. And therefore, I need to take simple poles in L. So this is the form of my lax connection. It's meromorphic, so it solves condition A. And it has simple poles at the zeros of omega, so it solves condition B. And then condition C, I solve by demanding that it satisfy this, um, this condition. So uh, this condition. Um, comes from uh, some work. Um, it was first imposed in some work by Severa on constructing um, E models, so general E models, not integrable E models, from 3D Chan Simons. So there's a, a nice construction of E models, which are a class of, of sigma models. I'll describe them in a second. So these are called E models, and they, they have the nice property that they sort of um, um, allow you to describe Poisson Lity duality in a very elegant way. So they come naturally from 3D Chern Simons, where the gauge field of 3D, 3D Chern Simons um, has this condition imposed on it, uh, on the boundary. And so you can do the same thing here. This is basically telling that if you take the, the gauge field of the 4D Chern Simons theory, you restrict it to the defect, then it should have this property that when you act with some linear operator E, which I'll define in a second, um, you get the Hodge star acting on this. So I need to tell you how to build E. And this E will basically be. Um, um, a special class of E. So in, in 
um, Severo's work, E has just some general properties, but I'm going to build a specific example, uh, which will be built from, from the following data. Uh, and this will turn out to produce an integrable E model. Okay, so it's a special class of E, which um, is an endomorphism of this um, defectly algebra. And the only data required to build it is to um, assume some decomposition of the set of zeros into two subsets, sigma zeta plus and zeta minus. So here's how this endomorphism is built. So you start with an element in the defect Lie algebra and all this business of um, assuming that, uh, or, or assuming that I have a double pole at infinity and gauge fixing at infinity, this was required so that my number of poles which are left uh, are equal in number to the number of zeros because um, the number of poles of a, of a meromorphic one form is there are two more poles than there are zeros in general. Uh, but uh, because we fixed uh, some data at infinity, we've got rid of two poles. And so we just have the number of poles left is equal to the number of zeros. So this is why this map here is invertible. So this map is basically taking a meromorphic thing on, in the bulk and just restricting it to the defect. And so anything, uh, any Lie algebra valued element in this defect Lie algebra, it comes from some meromorphic thing, some unique meromorphic thing in the bulk. Uh, by restriction. And then all you do is you just flip the sign on the, on the poles at zeta minus, and then you just uh, restrict to the defect again. So this is defining an endomorphism of the defect Lie algebra. And so this condition, all it does is it essentially imposes that um, the lax connection at a pole which is in zeta plus or minus. So if it, a pole at zeta plus or minus, this is going to be proportional to d sigma plus or minus, the light co components. That's all this does. So, and it's easy to check that because of this, um, the, the poles, when you take a commutator of lax with lax, they don't get stronger because these um, d sigma plus wedge d sigma plus is zero. So you don't create stronger poles uh, at a given zero. So the, the poles are split in this way to essentially ensure that we have the admissibility condition C satisfied. Okay. So, uh, this operator E, we can show under mild assumptions that it has this nice um, property that you can decompose a defect Lie algebra into two um, isotropic subalgebras. So remember K is an isotropic subalgebra, which is in fact a Lagrangian subalgebra, it's maximal. This is still Lagrangian and then this endomorphism E, um, under this endomorphism E, because E is a symmetric operator, this is still, is symmetric and squares to one, this is still uh, isotropic. So we have an isotropic, um, Decomposition into isotropic uh, subspaces, I should say. This is a subalgebra, but not this. And then we take a projection onto, uh, onto this component. So PL will be just projection onto this factor along this factor. So now uh, the claim is that um, it's easy to solve this constraint using such an operator. So we can find a, a unique solution to this constraint satisfying this condition, and it's given as follows. So um, here PL is the projection I've just described. So it's expressing here the lax connection in terms of L, which is the edge mode with infinity removed. And I told you that this was invertible. So in fact, you can really get the lax matrix from this, not just its restriction to the defect. So this is an expression, gives you an expression for the lax matrix in terms of the edge mode. And so if you plug all of this into the action, you just get this um, action for a 2D sigma model with a, a vesemir witten term. So it turns out that this is actually the action for an E model. More precisely, it's a, an E-model. I mean, it's a, it's a restriction of an E-model, which uh, is defined on GZ bar, but um, sort of a, a restriction to this coset. So um, the E-model really lives on this defect Lie algebra, but then you can reduce it to some sigma model on this quotient. And this is what we have here. So it's important to remark that these uh, sigma models, these E-models were built originally by Klimchik and Severa just uh, for the purposes of describing Poisson Lie duality, not, nothing to do with integrable uh, sigma models. But it turns out that all the integrable sigma models that we can construct uh, out of 4D Chen Simons, at least the ones we have with this recipe, uh, they're all um, E-models in disguise. So we have in fact a very large um, new family of examples, and I'll give you an example now. Uh, and these are all E-models essentially by construction. So an example, let's just take uh, omega to be this um, meromorphic one form. I'll just take a fourth order pole. So I have to relax here the assumptions I made before that I have only simple poles. Here I'm gonna take a fourth order pole at the origin and then as usual, a double pole at infinity. And so um, the, uh, the action in this case, uh, and I take 
So at the origin, uh, after removing infinity, I just have data at the origin. And this is the algebra with four degrees of freedom. Um, so it's four copies of the, the algebra G. And I take my isotropic subalgebra K to be this piece here. So recall that my field um, lives in a quotient of the defect Lie algebra by this subgroup. So in fact, uh, my fields are just going to live in this subspace. So in uh, fact, sorry to, to recall, is it uh, this yeah. Q deformed version of sigma model? No, it's not. Uh, so Q deformation comes from splitting poles. This is a new model. It's not. It's not deformation. Um, so. In some sense, it's a deformation of the PCM, but it's, it's a deformation where you add a new field. And the new field is coming from the fact that the, um, see the field content is in G and epsilon G. So we have a group valued field G and a field valued in the adjoint of the Lie algebra. Sorry, in, in the adjoint representation. So it's Lie algebra valued field. And so um, this is, the pair here is what I called L before. It's really a field which is living. So L is living in, um, in the quotient uh, k prime gz. Okay, so you've quotiented by this factor, so you're just left with two degrees of freedom, which are these g and u. And the action you see is just some the coupling of some PCM to some new field, which is adjoint valued. So you can build many new models like this. You just crank the handle, and and you get um, um, new um, integrable field theories, which are automatically e models by construction. So let me conclude. Uh, so what I've tried to explain is another way to see the passage from 4D transimons um, with boundary conditions to 2D sigma models, integrable sigma models, which are automatically E models. So this is going through this construction with edge modes. So um, I impose these boundary conditions in a different way, uh, which were homotopic uh, in nature. And then I restricted this 4D action down to 2D uh, by imposing various um, restrictions on the lax matrix. So um, this edge mode construction was uh, uh, first, or the edge mode construction via homotopy pullbacks was first understood in this um, paper in gauge theories with boundaries. But this is a generalization to gauge theories with defects, which are co-dimension higher than one. Uh, all the construction I described generalizes to higher order poles in omega. I gave you an example uh, just above. So the whole construction works in general. The only assumption you need is that there are there's a double pole at one site. And this is typically taken to be infinity. Sorry, in, in terms of, yeah, Godin, okay. Yeah, going there. in terms of Godin, uh, yeah, it's coming. So um, it would be nice to understand if there's a general way of constructing, uh, a general class of constraints, which are not E-model. Um, so in a general way, a general way of solving the constraint, which is not related to E-model. So uh, here I've shown you this E-model condition that E J star um, of L um, is equal to the Hodge star of J star of L. But this is just one way of solving the constraint, or one, one way of, um, what, the class of solutions of the constraint we've looked at have this property, but it would be interesting to see if there's other ways of solving the constraint and potentially also other ways of imposing the boundary condition. So this could lead to new uh, integrable field theories. So in the Hamiltonian analysis, which I told you is uh, closely related to the Godin model story, uh, it would be nice to understand how this story with edge modes, uh, with edge modes works in the Hamiltonian framework. So it's known that affine Godin models are closely related to 4D transimons. Specifically, if you do an, a Hamiltonian analysis of 4D transimons, what you find is the non local lax algebra for the, for the gauge field A in the gauge where AZ bar is zero. So you can go to some gauge and, and uh, you find that the gauge field of 4D transimons satisfies this non local lax algebra. And this is sort of built in because the non locality was encoded in this one form omega, which is essentially part of the action of the 4D transimons theory. Um, but what would be nice to understand is the relationship between boundary conditions, which you impose in the 4D transcendence theory, and representations of the affine algebra, which you impose on the Godin story. So uh, in both stories, you do different things. You impose either boundary conditions on the, the gauge field, or you impose, or you, you choose a representation of your um, Katz-Moody current, and both of these should be somehow related. So in you, you don't know yet how to generate a model from Godin. Uh, well, yeah, it's a paper in progress. I mean, all these boundary conditions, we have translations in terms of representations, but so it's known, but but uh, this is sort of in, on examples. We know how the boundary condition translates to a representation of the affine Katsumudi algebra. 
but it would be nice in general to understand what is the mechanism that relates boundary conditions of this 4D gauge field to representations of the f s moody algebra. But in terms of if, if your perspective was, uh, if your goal was to generate uh, two-dimensional integral field series uh, yeah. from Gaudin model, yeah, it's clear uh, what to do. From the Gaudin model, you just choose a representation. So you can choose more general representations. So for example, one thing which you can do in the Gaudin model, which you, we don't know how to do yet in 4D H and Simons is to get sine Gordon theory. So sine Gordon, we, we know the representation which gives rise to sine Gordon um, when you apply it to some specific Gaudin model. But um, the boundary condition which produces sine Gordon is not known as far as I'm aware. So an open question is how to produce sine Gordon theory out of 4D Chen Simon. So there are examples of representations which we don't know the corresponding boundary condition for. Um, and same thing for Toda theories. Toda theories can be built from Affine Godin, but um, not, not yet from 4D Chen Simon. Um, and then of course, the most important question is how to quantize. So I told you, um, some perspective on quantization of Godin models, but what would be nice is to understand the relationship between quantum 4D Chen Simons. And as David mentioned, really, we, we want to understand quantization of uh, non perturbative quantization of 4D Chen Simons and how this relates to the quantization of 2D integrable field theories. And uh, at the quantum level, it would be nice to understand the connection between Alpha and Godin models and 4D Chen Simons if this persists in the quantum story. So, in particular, we know that Alpha and uh, or quantum Godin models in the affine case um, are closely related to ODIM. And so this would provide some, some sort of uh, deeper understanding of the relationship between 4D quantum, uh, 4D Chen Simons and, uh, and the quantum story and, and ODIM. But of course, it would be nice to understand from a, just from the perspective of, of 4D Chen Simons whether the quantization has anything to do with 4D Chen uh, for, with ODIM correspondence. Okay, so I'll end here. Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you. Let's unmute ourselves and thanks, Benoit. Um, and now we have time for several questions. May I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, how do you characterize the representations of the affine cuts with the algebra? Are they from the integrable case or are they uh, some um, classes or what? Yeah, so. Um, I think so far, what I can say is about classical realizations of the Katsumudi algebra. So it's more uh, realizing this, the, com the commutation relation between such things in terms of Poisson brackets of fields in some phase space. Um, an important question is at the quantum level, what kind of representations um, of the algebra we should, we should consider? So I, I should really talk about realizations rather than representations. So there's no, there's no vector space on which we're representing. We're just realizing these generators in terms of phase space fields, if you like. You, you do not provide the central charges or what? Yeah, we do. But I mean, the, so the central charge is this level. It's just, it's some number, but um, these are classical realizations. They're not representations of the, um, of the quantum algebra. Um, so, I mean, the, the question about, representations is important in the quantum theory. So in the quantum theory, you want to put some sort of Hilbert space at each of the ZIs. Your, Hil your Hilbert space of the Godin model will be some spin chain with N sites. And these will be representations of the affine Katsumudi algebra. And it's not clear yet um, what representation to choose for various, uh, for describing various integrable field theories. I mean, in KDV, it's, it's understood. Uh, but um, I think in general, it's not really understood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the questions. There is a question in the chat uh, yeah. from Yanis. Yanis, do you want to ask? Yeah. Question? Yes, I, I was asking those uh, infinity forms, if they have any physical meaning. Does it mean to put something? Um, yeah, so they have a physical interpretation. What, what it's doing is it's breaking the gauge invariance down to uh, a constant um, symmetry, a di di diagonal symmetry. So um, essentially, um, you see, omega is, is multiplied by d sigma. And so um, when, so uh, well, the, the effect of, of having a simple pole at infinity rather than no poles is to break the gauge symmetry. So if you have no poles at infinity, your theory has a gauge symmetry.
so for example, coset models are described by, uh, by omega with uh, two simple opals, coset CFTs. So one over Z plus, um, one over Z plus K over, K over Z minus one. So this is uh, describing a coset CFT and um, these have, I mean, these are cosets. So in general, in class, in the classical story, coset sigma models are described by theories which have no simple, no double polit infinity. So that's the, the, so in other words, what we're describing here is just models with no gauge symmetry left. So it's the gauge symmetry is um, completely fixed. You can, you can reduce it to, um, yeah, to, to a theory with, with no gauge symmetry. Um, but I mean, because these models have a Godin model interpretation, they should also have a 4 dh and Simons interpretation. I mean, they have one, sorry, but uh, from this point of view, we don't know how to construct them in general, from this point of view of this e-model construction. But um, it's just a technical restriction. It's not really important, I think. So what you should get out of this whole construction is a generalization of e-models. If you were to generalize to the case with no double polit infinity, you would get what are called um, um, degenerate e-models or um, dressing cosets, they're called. So this is the expectation. Um, so these are e-models with some sort of gauge symmetry built in. Thank you. So if you consider a projective space a sigma model, so yeah. some of them are not integrable, it's quite understood. Like, yeah. do you see what's going wrong with them? In the quantum theory? Yeah. So presumably there's some anomaly. Um, um, yeah, it's not clear. So, it, I mean, I, I told you, we know how to quantize the Godin model, but the question is how to quantize the integrals of motion. So whatever methods should, allow you to quantize the integrals of motion of a general Godin model, something should break down in these cases. So the construction shouldn't be, I mean, you can't expect to prove all classical but integral classically, fittings. Classically, you, you know how to do that, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So cl classically, these are integrable and we have a Godin model description. So CP1 sigma model. Uh, in fact, it's, it's ultra local, right? Um, well, I, I have some also some proposal that these uh, anomalies are actually <coughs> chiral anomalies. So this, uh, this Youngian anomalies can actually go down to two dimensional chiral anomalies. I don't know how it relates to the good end story, but uh, in uh, models with uh, complex homogeneous target spaces like CPN, Grassmannian, Spleg manifolds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So then you can work out the anomaly cancellation conditions, for example, in uh, supersymmetric yeah, yeah. Yes. models that would, will work and so on, so, and minimal couplings of fermions, various couplings of fermions. Yeah. So yeah, I remember this paper. ABJ, my home. Yeah, there was a question in the chat. Can you introduce square root cuts instead of poles in the Z-plane? Um, but this are the cuts. Uh, this is just different parameterization, right? Yeah, I think you can choose parameterizations with cuts, um, but but the, the construction I presented is just assuming from the beginning that the parameterization is meromorphic. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I guess so the way to reformulate the question, so at the quantum level uh, for sigma model, or I don't know, if we take an equals for uh, super young mills, uh, whatever, super string and ADS5 coset model. Yeah. There you also have this, uh, the same, right? Um, form the same yeah. polit infinity and yeah. so on, you would yeah. say. But then at the quantum levels, it would be really cuts, right? You can't rationalize yeah. them. Yes. So, so, okay, I understand now the question. I'm not sure how how these cuts will appear in the Godin story. So I, I can say that the expectation is that in the Godin story, the poles stay where they are. Um, I mean, they, they might move under renormalization, but uh, at least they stay poles. And uh, in the 4D chain Simons, these correspond to defects. But then the point is that from the affine Godin model story, the expectation is that their spectrum is described by opairs, which have uh, pole singularities. The poles are at the same locations as the sites of the Godin model. And where these cuts would come from is in the solutions of the opair, which would, so, you know, you can construct TQ systems from 
um, spectral data of the au pair. So the au pair is meromorphic, but somehow the, the solutions have these fancy cuts. So I think the, these cut structure would appear in the TQ system, which are sort of built from solutions of the of the au pair. Yeah, connection coefficients. The quantum determinant. Probably. Yeah. Uh, But the quantum determinant is how you build these TQ functions, right? Yeah, it's just probably the, the simplest one, right, to see them. Yeah, so I expect that there are cuts, but only in through the solutions of the OD, not, not in the OD themselves. So the, the Godin model will never have these cuts, I think. Um, but they will appear in, in the OD I'm correspondence when you build a TQ system, I think. Because, I mean, this is just naively assuming that the whole Godin story for finite Lie algebras it goes over to the affine case. And from the examples we know, it, it seems to work like this. But like tip functions wouldn't get some extra funny analytic property. Oh, maybe we should st stop recording. Sorry, we, we get into deep discussion mode now. Any, any quick questions before we continue going crazy? I have just a quick question. So is there anything beyond this Godin models then? You mentioned in the beginning, is, uh, you think they're more general or something, so. Uh, what, do, what did I say? Uh, I mean, you mean XXX or XXZ? No, I no, I mean, these, F, these are fine Godin models that you're, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. other sigma models that are not expressible in this terms. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so the Godin model I described for you is the simplest example, but there are generalizations in many many different ways. So what you can do is increase the pole structure at each site. Um, you can uh, make the lax connection equivariant under some automorphism. So the automorphism acts on the Lie algebra and also it twists the CP1 by some, some root of unity. Um, you, can, uh, you can look at supersymmetric algebras. I mean, there are lots of generalizations and uh, different, all, all the all the integrable field theories we know, and all the new ones which have been constructed, they're all realizations of some type of Godin model. So with some some sort of generalization. So in all the examples I showed you, I always had to introduce some double pole somewhere because all the known examples have this higher pole structure. Um, but then, if you look, for example, at Young-Baxter deformations, they have simple poles, at least um, at, not at infinity. Um, but then the Young-Baxter deformation has four simple poles. So this is an, uh, an honest, uh, honest realization of a, of a genuine Afrin Godin model, but every other model, you need some sort of generalization. But these are still Godin models and, and they're well understood in the, in the finite case. So I, I don't think there's any, any, yeah, there's nothing new beyond Godin. The, the nice thing is that essentially all known integrable field theories um, come from Godin models. You don't need Heisenberg or, or XXZ. Um, although there's one example I know, which is ILW, which does come from um, XXZ. How do, how do you build find... XX in chain from Gadan then? Uh, no, no, well, it doesn't go that way, right? You, Godin is the limit of XXX, but I'm saying that there are some field theories which are uh, realizations of affine XXX, not affine Godin. So you need, you need to live to Heisenberg's in some cases, but in very few cases that I know of. The about generalization, if you take your defects and repeat it uh, along uh, one or two dimensional discrete lattice, will you get trigonometric uh, or elliptic air matrix, I think? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is not understood yet, but that that's true. I mean, you need some lattice which is infinite in the CP one. That's right. Yeah, and you have exactly. Different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also about defects. So, what did you use uh, that the defect is R two? Can you go to I don't know some yeah. Riemann surface? Ah, uh, you mean put a Riemann surface on for here, R two? Yes. Um, yeah, in principle, yes. Um, at least for, from the 4D Chen Simon's point of view, yes, this should be possible. In the Godin model perspective, in fact, um, 
it's less clear how to do this because you see in the Godin model, it's important that uh, you're dealing with an affine algebra. And the reason it's an affine algebra is because you have a Fourier decomposition of your fields and this happens on the cylinder. So technically speaking, the Godin model as I presented it is, um, is describing uh, the case when sigma is a cylinder where your fields have a, a Fourier decomposition along sigma. Um, but I mean, in principle, in the 4 and Simon story, nothing stops you from looking at Riemann surfaces on either sigma or C. So also you could put a spectral plane, which is not the plane, but a Riemann surface. And this would correspond to Hitchin systems. You could do this in the Godin story as well, and you'd get Hitchin, affine Hitchin systems. Uh, but I think not much is known about this. Yeah, maybe just some small restrictions on homotopy class of these boundary fields, because now it will, it will not be just um, uh, two-dimensional homotopy yeah. of the groups, which is trivial, yes, but now it will probably something not trivial and yeah, yeah, trivial true. in certain component, but in the rest looks mm, the same. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if uh, no other official questions, <laughs> we can stop and um, proceed with the uh, informal discussion. And let's say in the end, uh, before that, thanks Bino again for a very interesting talk. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Now let's stop recording.